was a bit early off the mark there. Hello and welcome everyone to this third part in our Catch the Wave webinar series. My name is Louise Hosking, IOSH president, and I'm delighted to be your host for today as we continue to look at what sustainability is, the importance of people in sustainability, and specifically the role that OSH can play in creating and maintaining socially sustainable businesses. With our Catch the Wave campaign in full flow, we continue to explore the importance of the links between good health and safety and effective social sustainability. At the end of 2021, the campaign saw us return to the fundamentals of good OSH. Now, this third webinar in the series asks, how can we move forward? Has health and safety stalled? And if so, how can we change the narrative? How can we influence managers across our organizations in how leading with a socially sustainable agenda will add value? This is our third webinar in the series. So if you have not yet been able to watch the first two webinars, I do encourage you to do so by visiting the Catch the Wave campaign page on the IOSH website or on our YouTube channel. Over the last two years, there has been a seismic shift in the wider public recognition for the need to manage safety and health at work. What can we do to harness this new perspective and perception of our roles? So today's session will look at the pivotal role that the health and safety professional has, not only in explaining the, critic, the, the criticality of good OSH to socially sustainable business practice, but also in persuading and convincing businesses of the folly in not adapting this approach. I'd like to welcome three individuals who join us today on our panel and to consider these questions. First, I'd like to introduce April Liu. April is the Global Sustainability Director of Lai Yi Group, the footwear manufacturer established in 1986, who specialized in vulcanized cold cement, functional hiking and army boots. April brings to this webinar over 10 years experience in strategic HR and sustainability in the footwear manufacturing industry. Goal oriented April is a creative problem solver and solution finder whose pragmatic and rational thinking makes her an expert at identifying shortcomings in systems. A very warm welcome to you, April. Next to join us is James Wise. James has over 10, 20 years experience in environment and sustainability roles. James has held a variety of site-based roles in the brewing industry, including health and safety advisor and group sustainability manager, in which he was responsible for day-to-day -day management of the sustainability programs and reporting functions. Prior to founding Wise Sustainability Limited, James also held roles with the manufacturer's organisation Make UK, latterly as the national sustainability lead of a team of specialist EHS consultants. James has been responsible for developing and delivering accredited and bespoke training courses for the past 10 years, including the Diploma in Sustainable Business Practices and the leading with environmental sustainability courses. Welcome, James. Thank you. And our final panelist is Craig Foyle. Craig is a chartered fellow of IOSH and a member of the Institute of Directors and appreciates the essential link between safety and leadership. He specializes in project safety management, training and management systems, providing consultancy support for clients internationally. He has worked in the Asia Pacific, European and North American regions and during the COVID-19 pandemic, the emergence of virtual training has expanded his reach even further into the Middle East and Africa. He has more than 23 years OSH experience working in FMCG, chemical, oil and gas, education, healthcare and pharmaceutical industries. 
Craig uses IOSH courses, including leading, managing and working safely to support organisations in their sustainable development. In his spare time, <laughs> he's also a very active volunteer and was the president of IOSH in 2017 to 2018, when I first joined the presidential team. And he is currently the chair of the IOSH Food and Drink Industries Group. Craig is passionate about raising the profile of the OSH profession and continues to engage with business leaders, OSH professionals and other stakeholders to drive the OSH profession forward as a whole. Thanks for joining us, Craig, and welcome Hi. to our panel. So um, thank you to everybody here for joining us. Um, I do have some set questions, um, but we do like to have a, a, a very conversational approach to this. Um, so if you are in the audience and have some questions for us to consider, um, I will reach those um, as we go through. Um, with the questions, but I'm going to um, jump straight in. And um, my first question um, is really for yourself, James, and then I'm going to come to Craig. Um, so catch the wave, the catch the wave IOSH campaign that we're running at the moment. Um, we're all talking about this. We're talking about social sustainability. But where does health and safety fit into this? Um, so, James, if I could come to you first of all with that question and then the same question to Craig. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and a really good question to start with. And one we could probably spend the next 55 minutes on. But just to keep it brief, um, when people talk about sustainability, I think most people tend to think of environment and to think of climate change and plastic in the oceans etc cetera, etc cetera, which absolutely is part of sustainability but you really can't be a sustainable business if you're hurting people your people are at the heart of your business that are the heart of sustainability and an engaged safe and happy innovative workforce there's an easy word for me to say is absolutely key in your sustainability program and your agenda and just a stat I was actually just reading just before this um, webinar started. There's been a real increased focus around well-being within businesses, particularly in the light of COVID. And I was just reading a quick stat here. That apparently, see if this is true or not, 25% of workers in the UK at the moment are actively planning to change jobs. 25%. And the reasons stated are they just don't feel valued. There's no sense of, of belonging. And this includes well-being, businesses focusing on well-being. So getting your health and safety, your occupational health and safety right is absolutely key to retaining your staff. If you don't retain your staff, then you've not got a workforce and whatever sustainability programs you have in place simply aren't going to work and aren't going to be effective. So that's where it fits. It's absolutely at the heart, along with the people of sustainability. And, and James, when, when we were getting ready for this yeah. webinar, you and, you and I were very much talking about the fact that if you talk to a business leaders, they, they talk about sustainability in their businesses all the time. So, so can you kind of frame where you see us fitting in that overall picture of um, sustainable, you know, sustainable business? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I mean, the the way of, I mean, I always think of sustainability is as a as a nested as a nested circle where you've got your profits in the middle, your social boundary, and your environmental boundaries. And in order to keep your business sustainable, you've got to keep investing into those uh, those those pillars and investing into your human capital. And that's where I think the, the debate needs to go with with business leaders around making sure that they're investing into that human capital in order to keep growing the business and enabling their the the profit to to to, continue to grow the profit circle as well so it's very much a balance isn't it you pull it over is. here and it, it pulls in the other direction. absolutely you invest into that social circle and it grows and it and it gives headroom for the profit circle to grow whereas mm -hmm. if you're not investing into that it starts to shrink and that mm -hmm. starts to then shrink in on the profit uh, mm -hmm. circle and that's, and that's just going to stop your growth. You need to keep growing the business. And if you're losing 25% of your workers, 
because they're not feeling valued, that's very soon going to have an impact on that profit circle. Absolutely. And and Craig, if I can't, could come to you with the same question, you know, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about social sustainability. Is this another thing for the health and safety professionals agenda? Or is it something that we've been talking about for a while? Yeah, um, yeah, in support of everything that James has said, but um, equally, I, I don't think it's anything new, Louise. I think it's something that we should have been doing and a lot of people have been doing for a long, long time. And because um, for me, I was my first role I did full time in safety and health was for an organization. And I learned very quickly that for the business to thrive, we needed to be safe and healthy. And so I tied that link straight away. And so we, we built safety and health into what we did. Therefore, it meant it was part of the norm. And so it made us a better organization. And so I know there's lots of talk about it now, but it's 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 not old. It's something we should have been doing for a while, um, but it's certainly definitely not anything new. And I think for me, that that inextricable link between worker safety, health and well-being and business being profitable and thriving is really there because um, some of the organizations that I've dealt with over the years, the ones that are investing in their people and training and developing and supporting their people, they're not only extremely profitable, and if we take James's stat that he introduced with, they're still there and they want to work in that company. And so people are now deciding to not just work for money, they also want to work where they feel valued. And I'm actually talking to people at the minute that will, will you know, some people may accept less money to be more valued in the role than what they do. Not suggesting that we need to devalue what we pay people in any means, but but certainly support them in a way that you know, they want to be better. And, and if we can integrate that with non-OSH managers and get them to believe it as well, which is part of the further topics we'll discuss, that's where we'll find the solution. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it is, and we're gonna come on to talk about language as well, which I think is a really key part of all of this. Yep. Um, so yeah, turning to you, April. Um, so, you know, we know right now the only, you know, we talk about it a lot. We're in this volatile work environment where the only constant is change. Um, but how can we as um, health and safety professionals support leaders and support managers within our organizations to manage safely and sustainable, sustainably. And, and you're, you're not a pure health and safety, you, you know, you're, you're an operation, very much on the operation side. So mm -hmm. can you give me some sort of work examples from your experience of how we can support our workers and, and why we should do so? Yeah, I mean, um, so I spent my like past 15 years in like factories, front lines, and we are in the like, footwear manufacturing is um, labor intensive. So we are facing, we are working with thousands, you know, of workers in one facilities. And, you know, in different countries like China, Vietnam, Indonesia, and the environment is changing. And even in the same country, some environmental impacts like climate impacts can be very different, like heat wave um, that hits some province in China that can really impact our productions or some like flood in Indonesia that can actually impact the workers coming to work or COVID that hits Vietnam like gradually this year. And so it, and each province, the, the medical resource is different and it impacts how workers, they see um, whether they, they, they want to risk their lives to come to work, to make their living. So as a, all such uh, professionals and managers at the facility, I think it's very important that need to be uh, sensitive and um, agile and nimble and to, to sense those you know, changes to workers' life outside of the factories, and then able to communicate to the leaderships or communicate with the leaders or supervised management, the stakeholders, and to come up with some like, you know, like uh, solutions or prevention programs. So if something really ha big happens, how can we make everyone feel safe 
like workers. So like in Vietnam, I this year I I see some worker that actually thinking about changing jobs. Okay, due to okay, because before they want to go to the big factory to work, because big factory means stable. But now they don't want to because big factory means more risk. They don't want to work with like thousands of people. They want to go to some 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 uh, company like with smaller size, which they feel safe. So I think uh, as an OSH professionals, we really need to pay attention to you know what are the impacts to our workers. And because yeah. that, yeah, that, that impacts all the productions. I, I love that. And actually that joins, you've just joined the dots between James and Craig there, where you've talked about, you know, we're, we've got this global skills crisis at the moment, haven't we? Um, mm-hmm. And it's really interesting where um, you've actually demonstrated Craig's point that people are, are physically moving positions to places where they can feel psych- psychologically and physically safe. Yeah, and for footwear manufacturing, we cannot work from home. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, so that's very different from the other, you know, industries. So when the COVID hits, we really need to help uh, with the factories, management and the workers, how to figure out and how to uh, reorganize our policy in order to provide a uh, safe working environments for people to come to work and yeah. to sustain their manufacturing productions. So th- thank you for that. Um, that. That was a really great initial insight. So I'm going to come on now and I, I'm again, I'm going to come to um, yourself next, James. Um, and um, similar questions for yourself and Craig around This is to do with culture. So thinking about um, internal culture and the challenges that we might face. And then I'm gonna come to April to talk about um, culture in um, territories where there's maybe um, fewer legislative frameworks. Um, But just thinking about culture within our organizations. Um, So so James, could you just um, sort of talk about the challenges we might face, um, you know, but equally the opportunities that come out of those for us. Wow, another big question. Um, Culture is a fascinating thing, it really is. I mean, it it evolves over time very, very slowly, um, but it can either be a major help or a major hindrance to a business. And I think there's lots of different ways of looking at culture, whether that's uh, the culture, the, the overall culture of the business or just tensions between different parts of the business again just a, a little example i was again, maybe sort of explains maybe a slightly different cultural tension but i was at recently at a site uh, with the health and safety professional there and he was looking to implement management systems into and we went we had a chat and he was saying well i've invited along the managing director to this meeting because i just don't think he quite gets it uh, and you know i just want you to to, to uh, see if you can sort of persuade him really around what we need to, that what we're doing is the right thing and speaking to the, the managing director came, and he was really nice and we had a really nice long chat around you know what it, what were his um goals for the year what was what what was he wanting to achieve and basically it, it was all around oh we've got i've got the end of year report coming up i've got this focus on profit we've got to get back into profitability because of covid we've got to do this and actually it was i was able to say well if you've got this management system in place, it will actually help to generate the report for you that you can then use somebody else. So rather than you spending your valuable management time dealing with this, we can actually have a process that actually generates this pro- this result for you. And he left the room, and after when the manager when the manager left the room, they said, hmm, never really thought about that. You know, it was just a case of lining up the agendas and showing that health and safety is not mutually exclusive to the overall direction of the business. And I think. That sort of culture where people, where managers get into this framework, uh, mind frame that it's all about profit. It's all about we've got to achieve goals and I've got this report to do, I've got this pressing need. It's actually seen that, well, actually designing your health and safety and your environmental program, but your health and safety program can actually help them to achieve that goal if it's done properly. And that's one way of overcoming those tensions. It's to get, it's to work out what people want and what people need and then align the programs to deliver that for them help them to deliver what they need to do and ensure that the two things are actually the same thing. 
think you're on mute, Louise. I was on mute, that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, <Happens>. so, <laughs> so yeah, I love that. It's, um, you know, I just running a small business myself is, you know, you have a lot of things to think about. And I think we've got to appreciate the pressures that our leaders have been under as well. And um, we've got to talk to them and create that environment where, you know, we look at things with a balanced approach because we all think our priorities are the highest priorities. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, Craig, um, a similar question to you, you know, um, around internal culture and, you know, how that can influence. Well, if I just take on board your last few words you mentioned about safety as a priority. So almost every organization will say that health and safety is their utmost priority. It's number one. Um, but actually in business, it's, there's lots of conflicting challenges all the time. And whilst I would not expect any business to bring safety down on their mission statements below production, we also know that without production, we don't have any need for any safety. So um, I think for me, in terms of the tension, I'm perhaps fortunate that I get to go into an organization and ask the daft questions that no one else would ask. Why is there tension in the first place? And, and sometimes there's tension because um, the, some organizations, they think safety is for the OSH team to deal with. Mm -hmm. Production people produce, OSH people do OSH. And, um, and so because of that conflict, you need to really have clearly defined roles. And the, the difference between safety and uh, for an OSH manager or a non-OSH manager, uh, yeah, thinking about the pair of them is that we've all got that same end goal. And so for me, what can we do from a cultural perspective? Well, we can find out what the challenges are and help them, enable them to meet their most significant risks first. And so if I'm, if I'm walking around um, a factory or a production line or a construction site, and I see something that's like really small and super low risk, I might mention it, but I won't focus on it and start spending three hours on something small. We'll find the significant issues. And if you actually help people understand that, that we actually need to prioritize and be pragmatic in our approach and, um, and help people, this is the other thing, help people to interpret what they need. So don't tell them this law says that, this law says this, they don't want to know that. They just want to know how to comply with the law. So mm -hmm. tell people what they need to know at the right time in a practical way that actually means that you give them some support, they get something done, they see the benefit, and then that's the step to step by step. Culturally, over time, people will then start to value the, the OSH resource that's there. But um, to do that, you've got to talk to people. You've got to talk to people in a way that they want to be spoken to. And what I mean by that is that for me, I've got a job I'm doing at the moment where I'm literally putting on overalls, walking around a chemical plant, and I'm spending a couple of hours out. Now, do I have time for that? I would have said no before I started that, but it's the most important thing I do because you're being visible, you're being seen, you're engaging with people. So sometimes you just got to go for it and think. don't think how you want to tell them it. Ask how they want to receive it, and you might get a bit further down the line. I love that. Put people first is what yeah. it's all about. So, so April, turning to you um, and thinking about um, culture in territories where there's probably, you know, there could be no health and safety legal requirements at all. Um, you know, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities that we have? You know, thinking in terms of, of culture and and what are your experiences of culture in different parts of the world yes i mean um most of the countries i i, I work at they are actually having some you know compliance standards and some um regulations for health and safety but the thing is that putting it into a a management system setting it up and running it is totally different things. And sometimes I, I, I kind of like what uh, a lot of points that uh, Greg mentions that is sometimes people don't understand that we are developing those systems or putting on those regulations to protect them. Like labor, labor law, labor code is actually to protect workers' rights. But a lot of workers, they don't understand. Okay, for example, like overtime. Overtime is like limited hours actually to protect their health. 
but some workers they they just need to make more money so they rather work in the factory that don't have any like work, work overtime like limits maximum limits so but for the factory they are actually having the systems then we need to persuade we need to making people understand why we are having so many regulations around like health and safeties and why we are doing you know the like petrols at the shop floors and or while we are putting it on the KPIs, you know, and people don't feel comfortable about that, but we need to make, make them understand. Mm -hmm. And um, the first step is use the language they understand. Use, you know, because we are doing this not for company, we are doing this for them. And then literally they will understand. So, um, yeah, so just thinking about, cause actually Craig was talking about that language. Um, and and we, you and I had a discussion around language when we were getting ready for this. And um, could you, do you just want to talk a little bit more about how the language that we use um, um, can, can influence in different ways? Okay, like my role is I don't consider myself as an expert, like in environmental or, you know, energies or, or health and safety but I'm managing this in the past decades. And, and I'm lucky that I have some like great experts in my team. But the first thing when I interview them or when I recruit people into my team is that whether I can understand what they are talking about or not, no matter it's English or Mandarin. So if they can put something, you know, very difficult, like technical turn into something very simple and I can understand, then I don't. I, I think they will have no problem talk, working with the other functions or shop floor, you know, mm -hmm. management. So, so the language is not about you know because I'm uh, all such professionals, you know, they they are used to use the terms or the the they, they are familiar with, but sometimes even though it's in the same language, but people just don't get it. Yeah, and it, it is is uh, because we. We definitely have a language, don't we, as health and safety professionals? And it's, it's again, it's coming back to what you were saying, Craig, is thinking about how we phrase things so that we phrase things in a way that people can receive them in the right kind of way. And we don't have to um, bamboozle people with our technical knowledge necessarily. The technical is really, really important. Of course, we have to know that. But actually, the smart stuff comes from breaking it down and thinking about how it's received and I, I love that thank you um so so James um coming to yourself now um I I love this next question because I I um, you know design we think about designing construction there's design uh, how we design our organizations um and for me by creating good design we can almost eliminate some some sort of hazards that we have um, in terms of social sustainability and how we create our organizations and how we design our organizations you know what are some some insights that you can offer around that around design around and designing the culture around designing the yeah the, and, and yeah. organizations and how you know how yeah, we yeah. approach creating yeah a strong organizational, I don't like to use the word structure in this yeah, context, but, but. Yeah, it, there's lots of elements in there, but I think one of the key ones for this bit is it has to be two directional. Mm -hmm. So a culture, it, it, to build a culture, it has to be about listening as well as telling. And it's about asking the right questions. We're, we're very, very good at asking questions. Well, we're, we ask lots of questions. We're not always very, very good at asking them. We ask lots of questions. Uh, we don't always get the insight as to why people have answered those questions. And I think that sometimes, I mean, I, I can just read in, uh, you know, you can ask a question, how, how are you satisfied with your, uh, with OHS, or OHS, uh, OSS age within the business? And, you know, you might, 65% might say yes. But what does that actually tell you in the long run? What do you actually learn from that? You, you, all you've got is a number. So it's around, it's very much around a two-way communication of listening to people, asking the right questions, delving into why people think 
what they're at, what they're thinking and why why they're doing what they're doing, what the perceptions are, honing that and getting that insight that you can take and having those discussions. And I think there's key things for managers in there about having those discussions with people. So why is it that you think that? Why did you say that? Um, how can we support you better to do that task? What, what do we need to do differently? And become a learning organisation. And it's a, it's a bit of an old cliche, learning organisation. But I don't think we do enough of that when we're looking at setting up uh, these sorts of systems and programmes. We do that because it meets, a, and again, so as the other panellists have said, absolutely right. We do it because it meets a legal requirement. But nobody really quite understands why we're doing it. Just it's getting done to them. And I think people much better at a role, engage much better when they're involved and understand why it's been done. And I think that's the key element. Of and when it's integrated, that's Absolutely. what we're trying to achieve, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, Absolutely. And we, but we don't know if it's integrated unless we know what people mm. are working towards. And we don't know what people are working towards and what they think about it unless we ask them. So yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's my take in, in, a, in a nutshell, my little take on that one. Yeah, thank you. It's a team sport, isn't it? It is. Yeah, absolutely it is. And it's good to talk as somebody, I think somebody posted on the on the chat there. It's good to talk. It certainly is. Um, Craig, um, coming to you, um, thinking about, um, this was the question about training that you and I discussed earlier. And um how, how do we support our operational colleagues that we work alongside to make wise risk-based choices um you know how, how do we do that i mean it, it, should they be doing the same training as us as health and safety professionals you know how, how can we facilitate this how can we how can we support them to make wise risk-based choices when they're doing all the other stuff that they're they're doing within their organizations well i think what we need to do is we need to um decide what we want from the training because many organizations i go to and they tell me about all their fantastic kpis and that everybody's trained and i go brilliant do they use the training that they're given well they don't measure that and so when i'm when i'm training for example i don't train people how to pass the course I train people the material so they can use that after they finish the course. And um, my worry is that on any level course you do, if you literally just focus on getting the delegate to pass, then they could, if they want to, leave that knowledge in the classroom or the virtual classroom and then go back to the day job. And that's why, um, for example, that the Irish Leading Safely course is really good, as you know, because you deliver this as well. But um, I like it because you spend a number of hours with a senior management team and then they have to produce a personal commitment which then if you if you're doing the training like i do for a single client you actually collect all those personal commitments put them into an action tracking sheet and reissue it back and then challenge them in three months time in six months time have you done what you said you're going to do and so at that level that's really effective and i appreciate you can't do that for the some of the other courses but for me it's about um giving people the right training at the right time in their career journey, but also let them practice it. So uh, I've got one client that um, to be able to approve risk assessments and method statements, for example, they've got to have completed the IOSH Managing Safety course. And that's really good. So they're actually having the training on how to look at risk and hazards and everything else, but actually they've then got to use it in practice and and for me that's the challenge and and that's why refresher training is there it's not for a training provider just to scoop loads more money in three years time it's to try and top up and refresh um, and make sure it's right but um, if you give people that ownership then they will start to take it on board and they realize that they don't have to contact the OSH professional every time they want to do something mm -hmm. and a truly supportive OSH professional will explain to people that with that increased knowledge in risk, you can manage that risk yourself. But if you make a, a wrong decision along the way, and there's like a slight issue, you're not going to, you know, the, the world doesn't end. We, we, we find the issue, we deal with it, you get the root cause, and then you support them again, and then they make any changes. And I think that's the challenge. Train people, make sure they understand it, and then empower them to do that role. But then know where the ceiling is. When something's beyond your competence, don't keep going stop have a good frame have a good yeah. frame <laughs> definitely definitely 
So, so I'm, and by the way, I'm going to start coming to the questions in the Q and A box in a moment. So, um, if you are in the audience, do and we've got nearly 500 people on the call at the moment. So, do put your questions in the Q and A bar, and I will be coming to those shortly. Um, so, just thinking along that the same kind of route of conversation, April. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question now because. You've been um, working alongside the teams in IOSH to help us to really frame this campaign um, and have been hugely supportive of the work that's being undertaken. So that means you've spent a bit of time with health and safety professionals. So, so how, from your perspective, how can health and safety professionals support you and you know if you if you know what's some advice that you could give the people in the audience here um can you read the so, so what would make you know what's the you know what kind of support do you need in your role from health mm -hmm. and safety professionals, you know, what are you looking for? What makes what makes good advice? What makes good teamwork with you? Yes, like um, I would appreciate if my team come to me and tell me about the system fraud mm -hmm. that's that's not working, mm -hmm. or the system that is actually you know put in there only for you know. Um, the government check our customers audits but it's not working mm -hmm. or I, I appreciate that you know my team they come to me for any um advice that i can actually because i'm a foreign foreigner i'm an expert um expat at you know my previous roles so i i told them that i don't understand about how people work or make things work at that culture at that place I, so i always tell my team is that okay the goal is this tell me how to achieve it and then if they can come to me and tell me some you know like solutions or some suggestions that would be great yeah yeah i i can agree with that more is don't come to me with a problem come to me with a solution definitely yeah and a lot of things i don't understand why you know why some people they just don't comply with the, the the procedures or some when we do the audits our internal audit we, we found a lot of issues and I just don't understand why we cannot you know make it and we sometimes we need um, uh, OSH professionals and especially locals to help us understanding what is the gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, no, that's really useful. Yes. So, so um, one, I know that you've got a really varied background and um, one of the um, areas that we were talking about is how you bought your varied, and, and I think this is the same for all of us, we bring all of our experience with us, um, mm -hmm. but you're, you know, we were talking very much about how people feel and supporting how they feel and, and, and using that, using your, your previous roles. Mm -hmm an experience and perhaps you can give us some insights into that. Yes, like um, I was, a, I consider myself more like a social worker mm -hmm. and, but I grew up in a footwear um, business, you know, family. Mm -hmm. And then I put my career into footwear manufacturing. So I found myself like in different country, I see uh, me as a social worker mm -hmm. and my clients actually um, those, you know, like production workers mm -hmm. with very low educational levels and their understandings about a lot of things are very limited and they need to really work hard in order to make a living mm -hmm. by, by working at the factories. And so for me, is that I consider myself is a, a role that I can, I, I need to protect them mm -hmm. by at least by law, you know, providing them uh, environments that, you know, they, they can work safely and in the long run, it won't impact their health. Mm -hmm. So that that's how I see my value in my roles. And that's how I always tell my team. So I empower my team and say, tell them that, hey, your role is very important. Okay, because you can actually help me to 
protect your own, your people, the people that in this you know communities. And for the team that are working in the environment, then they are actually protecting their home home because they they live there. Okay, and for the labor compliances, they are helping. You know, they are actually protecting workers' basic rights. So and and that's where you know you you put in the community that people are living in, and it's that you know good work we know is good for people, and then it becomes good for business, which is yes, what yes. We're about. And and I'm going to start coming to the Q and A box now. Um, Shane Burn has has said I absolutely agree with you, April. I live and work in Southeast Asia. Every country here has quite strict health and safety regulations. However, there are times when the rules are not enforced or more importantly, not sustainable to the employee when balanced against their productivity and rewards. So um, yeah, some words of encouragement for you there, April. Um, and James, I'm gonna to come to you now with a question um, from Florentina. Um, there's quite a lot in here. I'm not gonna um, read through the whole question, but what she's asked is, um, so working as a health and safety, um, she's been involved in um, consultancy. Um, how difficult, James, is it to shift the focus to people? Um, and what tools can an employee have to be able to, you know, where do we start? We go into an organization, you know, it might not be its top priority. We want it to be one of its core values. Where do we start? Right, <laughs> that's, that's a big challenge. I and we've only got a few more minutes left. <laughs> I was gonna say we've got 18 minutes to tackle that one. Right. <laughs> um, as with anything, it's around starting at the top and you look at where the and asking the question where the business wants to go and where it wants to be. Um, again, the, some of the stats, I mean, I, I, I refer to that 25 percent stat of workers wanted to change jobs early. That's actually from the uh, 2022 uh, sustainability trends report uh, by ERM. It was just out today, actually. Uh, but I think those are the sorts of figures that senior managers need to be starting to understand. You know, it's. If you don't value your workers, then this is what could happen. So where do you want to go as a business? Well, if you want to achieve you know, 15%, 10% growth, whatever that looks like in the next five years, how are you going to do it without any people? And unless you've got your people on board with you, unless you're giving them the right skills and competence, which I totally agree with around sustainability and the need for, for getting people trained, to make them competent, unless you're communicating with them, unless you're making them feel valued, then they're not going to stay with you. And they're going to move on to somebody else who does make them feel valued. And you have to start all over again with recruitment and training. And then you've got the start again, building a culture. And it just takes time and it just detracts from where you want to be. So I think it's around, as I said a little bit earlier, about aligning those goals and saying, well, your goals are actually, actually not mutually exclusive to the, the goals of social sustainability. In fact, if you do social sustainability well, it will help you to achieve your goals. Yeah, um, that whole talent management piece yeah, is huge. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what's going to get, and I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges in the next two, two or three years is business is actually retaining that, that talent. People have had a lot of time to think about what, what they want to do. I mean, the, it, the, the virus has necessitated people working from home. Now business is saying to me, you have to come back into the office. Well, do, you, do I want to do that? Or do I want to go somewhere else? To, and it, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be thinking about, well, do I want to continue to work for this, this employer? And mm. if they're not going to value me, that's just another reason for and not going to look after my welfare. They're not going to talk about my and they're not going to give me the skills I need to do the job properly. Then they're going to move on. And yeah. wherever your long term goals are, they're just going to you're not going to get there. Yeah, I think I, I hear that a lot, too. It's, you know, we we we've gone through so much change. We've definitely got a skill shortage. Yeah. Um, and that people focus is just, you know, there is no people tree, is there? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you've seen it, we've seen it recently in the, in the pay rises that have been offered to certain, to some of the jobs, you know, there was the, the and, and the vital jobs, but, you know, you're having to offer now huge pay rises to keep people because they're worried that they'll move on mm -hmm. and you'll not be able to recruit and Absolutely. all that will be seriously damaging to your bottom line or whatever growth target you have yeah turnover is really hard to manage in any yeah, business it is. isn't it
Yeah. Louise, Louise, can I just add yeah. to that? In the, to, to be effective, you've got to speak several languages. Now, not in the way that probably people probably think. So I've had to learn how to speak finance, management, uh, engineering, um, you know, whatever it is, whatever role it is. So if I want to make change in an organization, I go and talk to finance, but I talk about the saving they will have if they do this properly. You, spent, you spoke about design earlier. Mm -hmm. If you design out the risk, you're probably going to save a lot of money, um, not uh, actual real money, not just you might get prosecuted. Actually, you can make people's journey shorter when you're working out production layouts and things like that. So build safety in. And, and tell, when you talk to people in finance, tell them the savings. When you're talking to engineering, tell them the practical options. And when you're talking to workers, talk to them about going home and not having to fill out all the paperwork when you have an accident. And that's the challenge in that, you know, we've got to show that good safety is good business. And if you do that, then you get all levels tied and in together. Looking at, talking about what good looks like, isn't it? Yeah. It's, we like talking about the positive stuff, don't we, Craig? We do. <laughs> and um, Jake um, Moffat has said, he, Greg, Craig, I agree with you. Um, does the old adage work hold up that we as OSH professionals should aim to support, coach de and develop operational teams to develop health and safety for themselves? And we're really there to nurture and guide rather than do the doing. Um, Jake, I absolutely love that. I completely agree with you. Um, and turning to um, April now, um, Linda um, has asked a question. Um, how would you advise health and safety professionals in how best to approach a client or someone in a superior position, perhaps in a quite a structured company? How would you, um, you know, what, what are your recommendations for asking them to spend money on health and safety? How would they dig into their pockets? Talking about money, okay. usually when I know something that really requires investments, I will myself will work with my team, like brainstorm with my team. Are there any other alternatives that we can do it and without or with less money? Mm -hmm. Because money is very sensitive, and I believe that you know um, we can be very creative. Sometimes you want to um, reach the goal, you don't really need to go through like very expensive trainings. There are other ways, or we can break down the trainings into like seasons, so um, the superior they don't feel like oh they need to you know spend a huge amount of money for one thing. So. Uh, I would suggest that, you know, breaking the investment small. And so when the spirit, they can see the ROI returns from the investment, then they will have confidence in investing in more. So I think the first things before we go to the superior is I do homework. I do my, I do my studies um, really carefully about that. What, what would be the ROI that can bring from this investment so if that can really persuade myself, convince myself, then I'll bring that um, to uh, my leaderships. And my, I usually, I, I, if I want to do that, I, I can really talk through to my leadership to support me. That's my strategies. Yeah, and I think, um, uh, yeah, working in, and I think you work in some similar um, sectors to Craig, is mm -hmm. that um, your, your industry is quite process driven and used to measuring productivity. Yes. And it's, you know, can you, can you create a campaign that involves people and measure the before and after and, and hope, you know, uh, hopefully will increase productivity at the same time as we make people safer? Yes. And the most important thing is you, we really need to show people the impact. Mm. If we are doing something with no positive impact, then people that lose the confidence. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and just um, so coming to you next, James, um, Chris Germain has said, good answer, James. I guess one of the questions is how do you retain talent within your organization, which I think we've probably answered. But the question that I love for you is from Terence, and he says, which I love this question, are rule, are rule followers safer, are rule breakers less safe? What a great <laughs> question. Right. <laughs> um, 
I think the answer to that is no. I think it, 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 it Crikey. Uh, where do you start? Craig, do you want to help out here? I think it depends on whether the rules are right. Yeah, it does. You know, I, I had a client a few years ago. They had this program at the call. They, it was a three month lead in and they said, what is written is done. It was an absolute mandate. You must follow all pro rules, all procedures at all times. And it was a, they even had artwork drawn up and it was really, really focused on. Within three weeks, the campaign was scrapped because they realized the rules in many places were not correct. Yeah. And the, the, they developed workarounds because the procedures weren't good enough over the years. And so um, I think, uh, yeah, so it's, yeah, if you're going to enforce the rules, make sure that they're right. Um, because, it, again, a, a safety practitioner that goes out there with a clipboard and, and saying it's written here that you must do this and actually, you know, has a negative conversation with somebody, they, they're just perceived as, you know, a job's worth and they're ticking a box. Whereas if you actually go out there and say, what are you doing? How are you doing it? Um, oh, is that how it's written on the procedure? No. All right. Well, how do you then get the procedure changed? Have you reported it back? And, you know, can you think of what wording you would use? And have you spoken to somebody about it? Mm -hmm. If you engage people and bring them up along the way, they might actually go and do the official bit properly, change the rules and be safer because of it at the end of the day. They might yeah. not, but you've got to try. It's part I'll of being creative. Add, James. I'll, I'll just add in there. I mean, one of the uh, bits of the, that the unions used to do was work to rule, which basically mm -hmm. meant they only did what you told them to do. Mm -hmm. And businesses found that that was much more disruptive than actually going on strike in the first place. So that just backs up Craig's comment there that it depends on what the rules are. Yeah. And April, I'm going to come to you because I love that question. Thanks, Terence. Um, so from your perspective and thinking about, you know, different territories and about rules, um, that's an interesting question. From your perspective, have you got any insights, April? Is it safer to follow the rules? Are rule breakers less say? Uh, I would say the followers are safer in, not physically safe, mm. but politically safe. Oh, interesting, yes, yeah. Because yeah, I mean, in, I don't know the culture, the Asian culture or, you know, Western culture. I mean, followers are always safer. You know the break rule. Rule the, the the person that break the rule is always you know has to take some risk. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I I I, I kind of like put the physically you know safety aside, but I mean politically safety. Yes, follower is safer. Yeah, it's, 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 I think we could probably have an entire session on that question, which I, I think is great. Um, I, I think, you know, we sometimes need to step outside the rules to innovate. And um, if we're going to empower people, we want them to, you know, co continually improve, don't we? So, yes, but, for, uh, yeah, but I want to echo that for the rule breakers, actually, sometimes they are the person that can really bring some innovative ideas. Yeah to the organization you know yeah. but politically maybe you know they, they they need to take some risk to challenge the organization <laughs> absolutely so um yeah i mean i could i could keep coming to these questions but i'm i'm gonna um believe it or not we're coming towards the end of the session wow. um so it's i'm nice. Uh, yeah, I said it was going to go fast. <laughs> um, I'm going to come to each of you in turn and perhaps you can just sort of wrap up with a, you know, a, a positive insight that will um, support everybody listening on, you know, catching the wave. So, um, Craig, I'm going to come to you first. Um, so from my perspective, um, I think you just need to be very mindful of the recipient, who you're dealing with. So um, it's like I said, if you're dealing with finance, explain things in a financial way and in the analytical way. If you're dealing with production, you're thinking about, you know, how they want to beat their requirements. But um, but also, I think with non-OSH professionals, we need to let them focus on the message, not necessarily what the literal line of a law or regulation says, because we, we're there to help interpret regulations, let people know what they need to do to be safe. So, so give them the right information at the right time with the support to get it done. And that will build that in over time. And it does work, it really, really does work. You just need to invest your time in it and 
Um, um, James mentioned about leading from the top, totally agree. But I've also seen organizations that have led from the bottom because they've had enough. And they then, in a nice, correct, efficient way, um, work together to then get the management listening. And then they work together and then they go to awesome places. Yeah. Brilliant. So, yeah, top down, bottom up, side to side, and a bit of a shimmy in the middle. Yeah. Um, James, same question for you. Same question, Positive yeah. point Positive. to leave with. Yeah. For me, it's remembering that people are the heart of sustainability, and a safe, well motivated workforce is going to help you to achieve your sustainability aims. And, mm -hmm. and, and OSH is just part of that toolkit that will give you a safe, well motivated workforce. So it's absolutely the right time to be getting the message that OSH can help you drive towards the bigger targets. And it's not a, a niche, something to be sidelined and to be looked at separately. It's absolutely part of what you're doing. Brilliant. And there's still there's still um, stuff in the chat about breaking rules, which is brilliant. I wish we could capture that. Um, but same question to you, April. Um, to me, I think, OK, safety is important. But, you know, I want to make it like more friendly, you know, to everyone. Safety is not just important in the organization, but it's also in the community, in everyone's, you know, living areas. So um, for me, since I work with a lot of like um, production workers, so I always focus on the, the simple things, you know, they can, they, they can easily remember and what matters to them. They can apply them at work. They can also apply them at life. I can, they can also teach their kids, you know, and when they started to embed those, you know, safety uh, mindsets and turn them into behavior, then we can build that, um, build on that to, uh, and bring up to a ne next level. I, I love that is that, you know, we, we should definitely feel welcomed within the organizations for, for the caring professionals that we are. So I think that's really valuable insight. So, so thank you for that. Um, well, an hour has completely flashed um, past. Um, mm -hmm. Each time I host one of these, I think they get shorter and shorter. Um, but sadly, I am going to have to draw this webinar to a close. Um, it's been a fantastic session um, and a great contribution to what is continuing to be an impactful campaign. So in this webinar, we've noted that the OSH professional has a key role to play in ensuring that businesses become more sustainable in the future by putting their people at the centre of their concerns. I suspect that this is not a very surprising finding for you, given who IOSH represents. So as OSH professionals, we not only have the right technical knowledge to contribute to socially sustainable business, but also we have the right influence in communicating and leadership skills to make a convincing business case for social sustainability, workplaces, policies and practices. And this is about not, I don't call them soft skills, this is about true power skills. The experiences of our panelists clearly show the financial and other benefits of making occupational safety and health a legitimate business concern. It's up to all of us to use our technical and our power skills to demonstrate this working across our organizations as facilitators and influencers working alongside and with others as part of a team. There have been positive changes in the perception of the need for occupational safety and health management. This is a journey rather than a destination. There will always be work for us to do to make businesses and by extension our communities, regions and economies sustainable in its long term. So it's up to us as health and safety professionals to equip and position ourselves well and to drive good work forward. April, James and Craig, thank you so much for your contributions today. And of course, thank you to our delegates for joining, listening and learning with us. I very much hope that this webinar has been stimulating for the mind, but also a prompt for action. The IOSH Catch the Wave campaign is all about effecting transformation and helping you to articulate this. 
So do join the campaign and work with us at IOSH to make the most of our collective knowledge, skills and experience to shape a better, healthier world of work. Our next webinar in the series will take place on Thursday the 17th of February. Its title is Understanding People, Wellbeing Made Better. Right now on your screen, you will see details of how to get involved and where to go for more information. I personally want to encourage each and every one of you to visit our campaign page, which you can find easily on the homepage of the IOSH website. You'll find a whole host of information as well as excellent resources and content relating to the campaign, including the recordings for these webinars from the series. So with that, I bring this webinar to a close and thank you all for catching the wave with IOSH. People, sustainability and putting heart into health and safety. Thank you and goodbye.